in Paris, and then in London in projects finance and in capital markets. He joined BLF General Management in 2004 and was elected member of the board of directors and appointed deputy general manager in March 2006. He served as general manager of the bank since March 2010, as well as vice chairman of bank SBA France and chairman general manager of Libano Francaise Finance. He was elected chairman general manager of the bank in September 2014. He received a master's degree in business law from Panthéon Assas University in France, a master's diploma in banking and finance law from Panthéon Sorbonne University in France too, and an MBA from INSEAD. Welcome, Mr. Raphael. Good morning. First of all, thank you very much, Hiam, for uh, this presentation. I am the one, I'm the lucky one to be here amongst you to, today. I would like first to welcome you to Lebanon. I hope you're enjoying yourself and are feeling the magic link that we all share with our mother country, Lebanon. It is a very special place. I'm sure you will realize it. Sorry. Thanks to the great program put in place by, prepared by uh, Mrs. Hiam Bustani. I would like to thank her and the foundation for giving me the opportunity to present you our banking system. I hope I will not be uh, too boring for you, especially on, uh, on uh, Wednesday morning, uh, but feel free to interrupt me if you have uh, questions and you, if you need more explanations on issues I will, pre I, I will be presenting. Uh, you probably uh, have realized on, our, on your way here to, the, to this campus the strong presence of bank branches on the roads and on the billboards. As I will show you in my presentation, banking is not only a major industry in Lebanon, it is the heart of our economy, the backbone of the economy, the pillar of the state. To understand the Lebanese banking sector, you need to know who are the players and what is the regulatory framework. I will then show you its contribution to the economy and why it became known as a case of resilience. First of all, the players. Our industry is highly regulated and controlled. So of course, we have to start with the regulator. First of all, we have the Central Bank of Lebanon. Central Bank of Lebanon was created in 1964 you see here its, its mission, to safeguard monetary and economic stability, safeguard the soundness of the banking sector, develop the monetary and financial markets, develop and regulate payment systems and instruments, develop and regulate money transfer operations, develop and regulate the clearing and settlement of operations. The central bank is behind the success of our banking sector. And this is thanks to the vision and leadership of the governor, His Excellency Riyad Salami, who gave to the Lebanese people confidence in the Lebanese pound and in the banks. He has modernized the sector and put in place the regulations that enable the strong growth of the sector and its strengths. He has also built solid relationships with foreign regulators and states, which is essential to our sector that is linked to the, its, to the international networks of banks. We are then the Banking Control Commission, which was established in 1967. The commission is independent and supervises the banks and makes sure they comply with the regulations. They control through regular reports the bank sends and, and send them regular audits uh, teams. So they perform every two years on-site uh, audits uh, at, the, at the banks. You have to know that uh, the bank managers, us, we do not manage our bank alone anymore. We manage with a very close, supervisor, uh, super, uh, with a very close supervision 
from the Banking Control Commission. You have the Special Investigation Commission, which was created in 2001. The SIC investigates suspicious transactions and has the exclusive rights to lift the banking secrecy. I will come back later on, on on the banking secrecy in Lebanon. And to comply with international regulation, uh, we have set up the SIC. The SIC received requests from abroad, from uh, uh, authorities abroad. They are asking about uh, suspicions uh, names, suspicious transactions. They receive them. They ask the bank if they have those clients uh, at their banks. And then they do their uh, audit. They look at uh, the uh, the information, the KYC, the New York customer information that we have on, on, on the client, and then they decide if need be, if they lift the banking secrecy. So this was put in place to protect the banking secrecy of Lebanon, but at the same time comply with the regulations. The, the last, uh, the, the newest regulator is the Capital Markets Authority, which was established in 2011. And of course, its aim is to develop the capital markets of Lebanon and regulate it. And uh, the recently, I mean, over the last uh, couple of years, they've been extremely active to help us develop the, the markets and uh, implement the highest standards. So here are the, uh, the main players in terms of uh, regulators, and this is those you have to, to, to know about. Then you have the Association of Banks in Lebanon. The Association of Banks in Lebanon, it's uh, a professional body that regroups all the banks present in Lebanon, so Lebanese and foreign banks that are uh, active in, uh, in Lebanon. And this association plays a, a vital role. It uh, represents the profession, defends the interests with the authorities, state, regulators, and also abroad. For example, recently, over the last uh, four years, we have been, uh, I'm part of the, of the board, and we've been traveling to uh, US and Europe to uh, introduce our banking system uh, present, uh, presented because of most of the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the regulators or the, the decision makers outside, they don't know about us. And to see, uh, to show them uh, how we operate and that we are implementing, implementing the highest standards. And we have been quite successful uh, in the US and in, uh, in Europe. So this association is, uh, plays a, a vital role in uh, in uh, the relations between uh, the regulators, the state, and, and the banks. And finally, the banks. We have today 55 commercial banks in Lebanon. And uh, this includes uh, certain branches of foreign banks. So it's a very high number of banks for a very small country. Uh, just to, to show you the evolution, at the end of the war, we had in Lebanon 79 banks. So it's for a very small country, as, as, as you know. And uh, thanks to the incentives put in place by the, the central bank, uh, many have been acquired or uh, merged. And this is how we, we have reduced to, to uh, 55. Of course, it's too, still too many uh, for a tiny country. And uh, we have a very high competition in Lebanon because of this uh, very high number <coughs> of bank. So uh, we expect we should witness a consolidation of the sector in the years uh, to come. In addition, uh, there are 16 investment banks, and you have 10 representative offices of foreign banks uh, in Lebanon, and also 40 financial institutions. So basically, this is what we call the financial sector of uh, Lebanon. Lebanese banks have expanded abroad, and uh, today they have a physical presence in 33 countries through 40 subsidiaries, and those subsidiaries have more than 250 branches abroad. This is in addition to the branches we have in, uh, in Lebanon. And in addition to that, we have 61 direct branches in countries like Jordan, the GCC, Cyprus, and Iraq, and 20 rep offices. So it's quite an amazing expansion that the Lebanese banks have, have made over the, the years. Uh, their presence is in Europe, and you see in the major cities, Paris, London, Brussels, Geneva, and Frankfurt, and uh, in the MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa, uh, so Syria, Iraq, Qatar, Bahrain, Jordan, Egypt, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Sudan, Algeria, Turkey, 
here it's in addition to Cyprus, but Cyprus is part of uh, is part of Europe. So this is the presence of Lebanese banks abroad. One word about the foreign banks. They were major players in uh, in Lebanon before the war. All the top banks were present in Lebanon. I mean, this this was uh, the, uh, the 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 marketplace for banks for the whole region. They were all based here in Lebanon, operating uh, in Lebanon. Of course, with the war, many have have closed their entities and have uh, or sold their stake and have left the country. Uh, some came back after after the war. Uh, today, we still have a strong presence of foreign banks, and here. I'm showing uh, the banks that are uh, still quite active. You have Citibank, which is very active in Lebanon. Uh, you have uh, JP Morgan and Bank uh, New York Mellon. So these this are three US banks that have a presence in Lebanon and are very active, uh, mainly in correspondent banking. Uh, Citibank also in commercial banking in Lebanon. You have HSBC, uh, who has a, uh, a bank in Lebanon and is uh, active in retail banking. You have the uh, Credit Agricole, Société Générale. Société Générale has a stake in Lebanese bank. Credit Agricole, Credit Suisse, Julius Berry, BP are offering their uh, private banking services in, uh, in Lebanon. And you have, of course, uh, the rep offices like uh, the one of Standard Chartered, UBS, uh, Commerce Bank, and ITESA. And you have also the, the, the Arab banks that uh, you, you can see at the, the, the last line. So uh, it's, uh, it's still a very international place, and you still have uh, many uh, international players in the market here. But the Lebanese banks have, have, have took the, uh, the large market share. So uh, uh, most of the banks, the international banks, are either offering private banking services or offering correspondent, correspondent banking uh, services to banks. Let me emphasize on the most important player of the sector. It is the Lib Lebanese human capital. You have nearly 24,000 people working in the banking sector. And more and more women. Here also I see many women. And I will show you the evolution, which is quite uh, striking. In 1990, women accounted for 36% of the workforce. Today, they represent 47. And they will soon represent the majority. At, at our bank, my bank, they account for more than 54% of the workforce. So. <laughs> And uh, of course, this is due to the, to the fact that I mean, you have uh, many uh, young Lebanese who are, uh, the men are, are uh, after their studies, are leaving to, to work uh, outside of the country. Usu usually, uh, the good talent, the women good talent are, are staying. And, uh, and, this, and, you are, uh, and you are finding that they are uh, highly um, talented and, and effective. So, but this is also a trend outside of, of Lebanon. It's not just in Lebanon. If you go to any branch uh, outside of Lebanon, you will see that you have essentially women working at banks. Uh, at least in the retail uh, sector. This workforce is talented, very talented. And also, I would like to show you the evolution of the workforce. In uh, 1990, you had 28% of uh, the, the talent pool, uh, they, they had university degrees. In 2014, 75% of the workforce has university degrees. So it's an am amazing evol evolution. And also, this workforce is very young. In 2014, you see 50% of the workforce have between uh, 25 and 40 years old. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a young uh, workforce. Uh, the sector continues to hire. Last year, 714 graduates and professionals joined the sector, which is a very high number for, 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 for Lebanon. So I've shown you the, the players. Uh, if you don't have, do you have questions about the players before I move to the regulatory framework? Okay. This is uh, the boring part. Okay. It's the laws. Today, uh, our industry is uh, not only Lebanon and worldwide is highly regulated. We have, uh, we have, we are bombarded with new regulations all the time. And we are spending more time on uh, doing uh, compliance and uh, the police work and soon the tax collection work than doing business. So unfortunately, it's less exciting than it, than it used to be. So the regulatory framework. First of all, what are the essential laws? The, the first law that I would like to talk about is the banking secrecy law, which is essential to our sector and was, uh, 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 the, was enacted in uh, September 1956. The second one is the code of money and credit. 
This law is the main regulation of the banking and financial system. It covers the regulation of money, the role and functions of the central bank, the activities of banks in addition to other activities related to banking and finance. Then you have the law 318 of uh, 2001. Uh, I just mentioned it when I was talking about the SIC. This law is about uh, fighting money laundering and criminaliz criminalizing the proceeds of crime. And then you have the circulars that are uh, uh, enacted by the central bank. And uh, the, we, uh, we have many, many circulars. Those are extremely important uh, and are related to uh, compliance, the control of operation with customers in order to avoid any involvement in operation related to money laundering or terrorist financing and all the requirement about enhanced due diligence. Implementation of measures related to correspondent bank, I will come back to this because this is extremely important. And the creation of customer KYC and legal compliance departments. This is the trend now in, in banks uh, worldwide. You, have, you are hiring more people in, uh, in, in uh, compliance departments. Finally, you have circulars uh, requiring banks to respect foreign regulations and the latest one is FATCA. And FATCA is, is for US persons. I don't know if you have here US persons, but basically there is no more banking secrecy for US persons. Uh, they have to, uh, even if they have an account in Lebanon, uh, they have to, to sign the lifting of the banking secrecy and they have to change to, to share the information with the IRS, so the tax authorities in the US. Banking secrecy. I will read the slides because this is very important for you to understand. The managers and employees of banks and any person who, owing to his her capacity or position, has access by any means to the bank's books, operations, and correspondence are absolutely bound by banking secrecy in the interest of the client of the said banks. You have to know that uh, it is a criminal uh, offense if you break the banking secrecy. So basically, you, you go to jail, okay? So uh, any person who intentionally violates the provision of the banking secrecy law shall be punishable by imprisonment for a period of three to 12 months. The same punishment shall apply to any at attempted violations. So any information related to accounts cannot be disclosed to any party without the specific consent of the account holder. Banking secrecy can be lifted only with the specific approval of the account holder or upon the death of the account holder by his or her immediate heirs or if the client is declared bankrupt. In order to safeguard lending activities, banks may exchange information related to their clients' debtor accounts confidentially and in the monks and sell. But this is only about debtor accounts. So everything related to deposits, we cannot share. So this is the banking secrecy law. Now, of course, with the evolution of uh, the international uh, regulations, uh, we had to find ways to, to comply. And we, we talked about the law of 2001 and the creation of the SIC. And uh, we were able, with uh, the laws and regulations that we have put in place, to satisfy international requirements of transparency while maintaining the most important aspects of banking secrecy. I have also to say that we have developed today a culture of compliance within the industry, and this is very important. It's not just uh, rules and regulation. It is a question of, of, of cultures. A few years ago, a bank was sanctioned by the US and disappeared. It's the Lebanese Canadian Bank. This event has raised the awareness among bank employees of the importance of being compliant. I believe they all know now, they all understand the compliance, that compliance is at the essence of our business. It is very important to understand that the Lebanese banking sector is connected to the international banking community. Our clients operate worldwide. They need to transfer and receive money. They need to issue letters of credits and letters of guarantees. In order to perform the services, banks need to have correspondence. So they need to comply with the laws of the correspondence. This is why we need to understand the laws and regulations that regulate the correspondence. This is why we're applying the US law. This is why we're applying European law in Lebanon when we are dealing with, uh, with client. And this is also very important to, uh, to understand.
The banking sector is a leader in the adoption of the latest international accounting standards. Furthermore, the central bank requires that banks be audited by two independent auditors, and one of them is always an international audit firm. So we are extremely well uh, controlled. Our central bank was among the first to implement Basel II and later on Basel III. I mean, probably when you read the newspaper, you hear about Basel II and Basel III. Uh, these are the international standards of the industry uh, for the level of capital banks need to operate and other important ratios and regulations. And the central bank goes beyond uh, those regulations. I have to give you an example. Uh, Lebanon implemented Basel II as soon as it was enacted. The, U the U.S. never implemented Basel II. To, to show you, uh, uh, we, we, were, uh, we started implementing it before, in, uh, before our banks in France starting to, to implement Basel II. And as soon as Basel III was uh, um, published, even before, in fact, when it was still a draft, the central bank started asking the bank to uh, increase the level of, of capital and to, to implement the, uh, the, the requirements of Basel III. And they even went beyond that. And I think this is an important point that I would like to, uh, to highlight regarding uh, Basel III. I will show you this maybe on, on the slides. It will be easier. Uh, Basel III requires a minimum of capital adequacy ratio. I will explain what is capital adequacy ratio of 8%. Basically, capital adequacy ratio, uh, for every $100 of loans you want to, to give to a client, you have to have a certain level of capital. The capital adequacy ratio uh, of Basel III required to have 8%. So for every $100 to have $8 of capital. Our central bank asked us to have $12. So we need 50% more equity for the same loan, which is extremely high. And uh, Basel III uh, made a difference between a regular bank and systemic banks. So banks that are, you see, in the, during the financial crisis, we, we were afraid that all the financial system collapsed. And this is because you had systemic banks that, that uh, had uh, trouble. So the, the Basel III is requiring those systemic banks to have 10.5%. So we are even above the level required by uh, the Basel III for systemic banks. And this is to show you how conservative uh, the governor and the central bank is and uh, the types of high regulation that you are implementing here in in Lebanon. I would like to show you, uh, in order for you to understand also this conservative approach, the important ratios uh, that we have to, to, to implement. Of course, this is just a summary of them. So first, I, I, I spoke about the capital adequacy ratio. I would like to, to uh, talk about the loans to deposit ratio. So this is basically the maximum we are allowed to lend to our customers. We cannot lend more than 70% of the deposit we receive from our clients. Outside of Lebanon, you have uh, ratios above 100%. So there is a big, big difference. And this shows that you have a high liquidity in our system. Furthermore, the central bank requests that 50% of the deposit we receive in foreign currency, in dollars, euro, pounds, 15%, they have to be placed with the central bank at a very low uh, cost, so a uh, very low interest rate. It's close around, it's around 1%. So it's very low. In Lebanon, we pay on average on uh, foreign currency deposits uh, three and a quarter percent. This is the average cost of uh, funds. So we have to place 15% central bank at one. And we have also to place 50% of 15% of our term deposits in Lebanese pound, 25% of our current account, so the money that's, that is not placed just uh, in the, the, the current accounts of the bank, also with the central bank at 0%. So it's a high cost for, for the banking system, and this allows to have a high liquidity in the system. Also, and this is very important and explain why we're not hit by the, uh, one of the reasons why we're not hit by the financial crisis, is that we're not allowed to, in, to invest in securities that are not at least investment grade. Investment grade is the, the, the quality, uh, so with, with uh, counterparties that, that have a low risk of failure. The only exception, of course, is, the, is Lebanon. We, we, we are allowed to invest in the bonds of, of Lebanon. Also, and I will finish with that, we, uh, the maximum we can lend to one customer or one group of customers is 20% of our equity. 
And if this customer of the, 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 the project is outside of Lebanon, it's 10% of equity. So you, you have a limit on the concentration you can take in terms of risk. So these are very conservative uh, regulation ratios that the central bank has put in place. So I think I have uh, the, the boring part is, I mean, hopefully, the boring part is, uh, is now uh, finished. And I can move to something which I think is more interesting is how we are contributing to uh, the economy. Should maybe uh, go faster. So first of all, you have to know what is the size of our economy. I don't know if you have any idea. You know how much is the GDP of Lebanon? No? Any idea? OK, our GDP today is $50 billion in 2014. And uh, 10 years ago, it was half, half this, this level. At the end of the war, so in uh, 20 years ago, the, any idea what was the GDP of Lebanon at the end of the war? $2 billion. So you, you, you can see the, the strong increase of the, the, the size of our, of our economy. And it is important to compare the banking sector to the size of the, uh, the economy. So what is the size of banking sectors? Total assets of banks in Lebanon, and this is excluding our subsidi subsidiaries outside of Lebanon, so just the, what we have here in Lebanon. And it's $175 billion. It's a huge number. Deposits, so what we are collecting from our, uh, from our clients, is $148 billion. So the, the level of assets represents 3.5 times our GDP. Uh, the, the, the level of our deposit represents 3 times GDP. This shows that we have a high level of savings in Lebanon. And this is also extremely important. 64% of the deposits are in foreign currency. So it's, highly, it's still highly dollarized. Mainly it's dollars. Then you have euros, but it's mainly, mainly 90% are in dollars. The equity of the banks is $15.7 billion. I will come back to this. I will show you the evolution, how we have built equity over time. And last year, the total profits of banks in Lebanon is $2 billion. So it's a very successful industry. This was the liability side. So uh, we, we, we get funding from our depositors. We have the funding from shareholders, the equity. What do we do with this money? And this is what we do. We first lend to the private sector. And we lend $51 billion. I'll come back to this also to show you the strong evolution we had. We place with the central bank. Part of it is uh, compulsory, as I show you. We have to do it. And other part is because it's a good placement. We have placed $64 billion at the central bank. We have placed money with foreign banks. This is liquidity that we, uh, that we, we, we keep outside. It's $12 billion. And we have an exposure to the government, which is $37 billion. And I will also come back to this in another slide. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, the balance sheet of the sector. I would like to highlight the fact that uh, we have 1,447 branches in Lebanon. So one branch per 2,000. 700 inhabitants, and this is quite also amazing. I will not, I will just uh, enumerate the banking activities. Basically, Lebanese banks are uh, universal banks, and we, we, we operate and we, we, we have this, I mean, all the, the, the business lines uh, that you can see outside, corporate and SME banking, retail banking, private banking, treasury, capital markets, investment banking, and correspondent banking. So we, we, we are, it's a quite sophisticated uh, market. So uh, how do we contribute to the economy? First of all, we finance the private sector. And this was, in the past, one of the uh, criticism that the banking sector was receiving. receiving. Uh, they were, uh, I mean, usually people were saying, okay, they just finance the government, don't, they don't finance the, the private sector. Well, today, we have more than 100% of our GDP financed uh, by the bank, so uh, for the private sector. This is a very high uh, ratio, one of the highest in the world. So we are, uh, we are financing the private sector. Of course, uh, this does not imply a high leverage of the local population because there is a certain level of concentration, and I'm going to show uh, this. But look at uh, the involvement of the banking sector uh, with the private sector. In 2009, we had $28 billion of 
uh, lending for the private sector, we are now at $51 billion. This is in five years, six years. The loan segmentation, we are lending 56% to, of our uh, for loans to uh, the corporate sector. Corporate is not like outside, and it's, uh, corporate, it's large companies in Lebanon, but of course, uh, if you take the international definition, it will still be called SMEs. So, but 56% for the corporate sectors, and you have 30% retail, 18% in housing, and 12% for consumer loans, revolving cards, etc. This business is growing the the uh, the retail uh, the retail side of the of the of the business. Uh, the central bank has enacted also laws to uh, take into consideration the repayment capacity of the borrowers uh, to avoid uh, a subprime crisis like in the U.S. So here, for example, you cannot lend more than I mean the the installments that the family has to pay should not be more than 35 percent from the income, the monthly income, and this is very important. We also finance the trade of Lebanon, and uh, you have to know that uh, the commercial trade of Lebanon uh, is in, two, in 2004 was of uh, the, the $24 billion, so this is import plus exports. Uh, we witnessed a decrease over the, the last uh, two years. Uh, there is an impact of the Syrian crisis, the fact that you cannot uh, also uh, uh, use uh, the, the roads to, to send goods. Uh, the Syrian market was a very big market, and uh, also, uh, you have the, the commodities, the price of commodities that, that dropped uh, uh, last year, mainly uh, oil. The total level of uh, letter of credit that we are opening is $22 billion. So it's a very large, uh, we are financing the tr a large part of the, most of the trade finance of uh, Lebanon. And as I said before, we, we, are, we have now a strong retail banking culture. We have 2.4 million active credit and debit cards in Lebanon. 1,630 ATMs. You will see ATMs everywhere. We don't have uh, trouble to, to get cash. Uh, the housing loans uh, amounts now to nearly $10 billion. So it is uh, really impressive. And uh, this, I mean, the retail bank really started in 2000, 2001 in Lebanon. So over the last 15 years, we were able to grow uh, this, uh, this business. Now the financing the government, this is what you read uh, about in the press. And contrary to what the press usually say, uh, we can see here a drop in terms of percentage of uh, the, the level of exposure, direct exposure of the banks to the government. So the, the direct exposure is when we buy treasury bills in uh, Lebanese pounds or euro bonds, which are in foreign currency. Uh, in 2014, at the end of 2014, we had uh, $21 billion in uh, treasury bills. So it's in our own currency, in Lebanese pound and $16.6 .6 billion in euro bonds. And uh, it's, if you remember the, the slide before I showed you the level of equity of the bank, the bank have, uh, they have uh, $15.7 billion of equity. So basically, what we are lending the government in foreign currency, which is the risky part, is basically our equity. Before concluding, I would like to briefly show you how the Lebanese banking sector became a case of resilience. And this is why I would like to have your attention because this is the most important uh, slides. The graph shows you the evolution of dep deposits from 2004 till now, so the last 10 years. And you see that we had around $50 billion of deposits. We are now at $150 billion of uh, deposits, and we went through major events over time, even earthquakes. The assassination of Prime Minister Hariri was felt like an earthquake. He's the, the, the person who uh, has rebuilt Beirut. He's the person who brought back confidence in the, in, in, in the sector. We didn't know how, uh, the, what would be the reaction of the depositors, what would be the reaction uh, of uh, the investors in Lebanon. We only had a drop of 3% of deposits, so outflows of deposit from the system, 3%, which is nothing. And in, after a couple of months, the money came back to Lebanon, and we witnessed a strong growth that year. Again, 
In 2006, we had one month of war, but it was not war like in 75 to 1990. It was a war we had an embargo uh, from the, the sea and all the borders. We couldn't leave Lebanon, and we were bombarded all the time. And also, we witnessed only 3% outflows of money during this period. Banks continued to operate. Clients continued to, to operate without any, any trouble. And also, after the war ended, the money came back, and we witnessed a strong growth. In fact, we had an acceleration in growth since 2006. Then you had the major event, which is the, the international financial crisis in 2008. People start sending more money to Lebanon because they're starting to realize that, you know, that they trust the Lebanese banking system, they trust their bankers, they start having uh, an issue with uh, uh, banks uh, in the Western world, and this is when we had the, the real growth in terms of, of deposits. And even after, even after the start of the, the Syrian crisis, we continue to, to have a strong growth. It is, uh, the, the growth is now more uh, moderate uh, of the last couple of years, but it's, it, it's still adequate. So I think this is, this is a, an amazing uh, slide that really shows the resilience of our banking uh, sector. I'm showing you here also the evolution of the, the ratio of loans to deposits, so you see that uh, we are only lending, although we are, we are allowed to lend 70% to our customers, we are only lending 39% of our deposits to customers. So we have a high liquidity in our system. The minimum ratio is 12% capital adequacy. We, it's close to 15% for the, for the sector. And we have an adequate profitability. You see the ROA, which is return on average assets, it's 1%. Return on average equity, 11%. So it's a profitable, profitable sector. This, I referred to the slides earlier because uh, this, is, this will show you uh, the confidence that the, Lebanese, uh, that the shareholders of Lebanese banks have in, in their banks and in the system. From 82 to 2014, the level of equity disappeared with the war due to the valuation of the Lebanese pounds. And now it's close to $16 billion and it represents 9% of our balance sheet. This showing you that not only we are making money, but we are reinvesting the money in the system. And this is not like uh, doing a real estate project in Lebanon and you get your money out. Here, more than 60% of what the banks are doing is reinvested in, in the system. And I think this is, this is very important to show the confidence we have in, uh, in our banking system. And this is the last slide. Uh, this also to show you uh, the resilience of the banking sector. Over time, you see the same events, and you see how the central bank has built the forex reserves. It was around $10 billion in 2014, just before the assassination of Prime Minister Hariri. We are now close to, here at 35, we are close to, to, to uh, 40, $38 billion now. This is forex reserves. In addition to that, we have $15 billion in, in gold. So we have reserves of $50 billion. This is 80% of the deposits of uh, the, the banks at the central bank. So it's uh, uh, what you are placing at central bank is mainly in cash and gold. And you see the, the growth rate that we have witnessed uh, just uh, after the, the, the war with uh, the, the war of 2006, very strong growth in 2007, 8, 9, 10, and then a moderate growth when the Syrian crisis started. So this slide with the two previous shows you the resilience of the banking sector. I will finish with, uh, with uh, first of all, the, the takeaways I would like you to take and uh, how to see the, the, the sector going forward. The takeaways, what I would like you to, uh, what I would like you to, to keep in mind, that our sector is a resilient banking sector. It's the pillar of the state, the backbone of the economy. We have skilled talents a culture of risk and governance, a high level of liquidity and solid equity, a high level of liquidity and solid equity. Going forward, I believe the banking sector has many opportunities to continue to grow and shine. First of all, banks must help the government and the administration to reform and adopt public-private partnerships. Banks are ready to finance such partnerships. 
in the electricity sector, telecom sector, waste management, recycling, oil and gas, to name a few. Second is the knowledge economy. Thanks to the vision of our governor and the circular 331, the banking system will inject $400 million in equity in startups in Lebanon. This aim is to create jobs in Lebanon, to retain talent, brain power, to even attract Lebanese from, from, from outside to come back and work in Lebanon. And this is working. Already half of this amount has been allocated to, 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 to funds. And I think this is a major breakthrough. The ecosystem will grow and will offer many opportunities. This has also helped the development of asset management in Lebanon, which is a major industry and the future of uh, the banking system. Thank you for your time. You can bank in us. Come bank with us. We have 10 minutes for the questions. Welcome to Mr. Frame, welcome to Mr. Maushi. Ahla uh, wa So, we need the micro, please. This is Danny Tuma. Hello. Your name and your country. Danny from Australia. And your background? Lebanese. Uh, of course, my background. Um, my background for work. Yeah, work studies. Yeah. My studies, yeah, I studied um, finance and law. Finance and law. And I do now tax structuring and infrastructure, project finance. So there'll be questions related to that. Um, first question, sorry if I bore everyone, is for your capital and your equity for, let's say, regulation and um, capital adequacy for Basel, is it Lebanese capital, capital, or is it foreign American capital, or Australian capital, or, or? And the second question is, um, we talked about infrastructure, and you got a little bit on there about PPPs. In Australia, we have the problem that it's not really a problem, but there's plenty of capital, and the margins are very tight on financing. We have lots of capital. For there's plenty of banks that want to put debt in and equity in our projects, but we don't have a lot of projects to put. I think in Lebanon there'll be a case that we need a lot of projects, but the banks are a little bit unsure if they want to put the capital. Do you think they will actually want to put it and at a reasonable rate of return for them? Or they just don't want to do it? Okay, you have uh, two interesting questions. First of all, uh, the shareholding of banks is mainly Lebanese. So it's mainly Lebanese money uh, from uh, people in Lebanon or people uh, Lebanese from the diaspora. So uh, this is probably, I mean, I don't have the statistics, but uh, you have uh, most of the, you, you have, you have uh, um, uh, people from the Gulf who invest in the banking system, but the bulk is, is Lebanese. And uh, uh, I'm, you are reminding me that I didn't, didn't address this also in my presentation. I forgot to tell you that also the deposits, 80% of the deposits are from uh, residents, people residing in Lebanon or people, uh, have, having an address in, in Lebanon, and 20% is from non-residents. So the non-resident can be Lebanese uh, with a registered address outside of Lebanon or uh, foreigners. So this is regarding uh, the source of, uh, of funds. Uh, regarding uh, financing and uh, projects, uh, you're, uh, we have the same problem in Lebanon. We have a lot of uh, liquidity, as you can see and you have very little opportunities. It's a small market. This is why Lebanese banks were obliged, in a, in a way, to go outside of Lebanon uh, to, to find opportunities to, to lend or, or, or invest. And, but we, we were not doing this uh, blindly. Um, we were mainly doing this with our clients, so all, all the, the top Lebanese businessmen and uh, companies are very active uh, outside of Lebanon. Uh, uh, Mr. Frim is here and he has uh, their, their industries, they have industries in Lebanon, they have industries outside. So we are accompanying our clients uh, in the growth outside of, of Lebanon. Uh, today, uh, we, uh, with the, 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 uh, the, the growth that are slowing in Lebanon, we, we have difficulties to find opportunities. And this is why I'm, I'm saying it's very important uh, in order to grow uh, and to, uh, to push the, the country forward to, to, to have a stronger growth, to start the PPP projects, and banks are ready to finance them. 
So now, in terms of rate of returns, uh, okay, we have we have high cost of funds. Uh, I said in, in foreign currencies around uh, three and a half, three and a quarter percent. Uh, in uh, the Beirut reference rate, which is uh, the rates of uh, that the association of bank is calculating for the cost of banks of uh, operating and uh, getting funds of outside is six percent. So you have to have rates above that to uh, to pay for the operations and the cost of funds. But it's adequate. I mean, uh, you're in Lebanon. Maybe my question is a little biased because I want to talk support for the PPP. And I'm talking here about the public sector. Uh, do we have a vehicle and the legal framework and the administrative framework that permits PPP, PPP in Lebanon now? Even before uh, the, the law that was enacted regarding PPP, we already had PPP projects in Lebanon. I mean, uh, in our case, our bank has financed in uh, just after the end of World War II uh, the, the, the local part of two uh, stations, the Zahrani and Bedawi uh, station. You had the funding from outside, uh, and the local part was financed for, from our bank, and this was uh, uh, close to PPP projects. Uh, if you look at telecom industry, also you had financing from uh, from local banks. So uh, even without the law, I think we can we can find always ways to uh, to finance the industry. Now you need certain protections, and for example, for the electricity sector, if you want to uh, to invest in the, the sector, you cannot have just two years uh, of protection, which the last law that was enacted. You need more than that. You, you need to give time to investors to uh, get their money back and have a good return of on their capital. I, I'm speaking on, in particular of the waste problem that we have today. Mm -hmm. Could municipalities today get financing through a PPP project from your bank or from any other bank to develop a waste treatment facility knowing that by law, municipality cannot borrow money? Well, I, I haven't looked yet at, uh, at the, 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 the issue of the, the waste management. But if you take, for example, the, the, uh, the contracts uh, that for, uh, the, um, for the electricity, they have divided also the country and to, to they, have, uh, uh, they give for uh, private companies to collect uh, the money from, from the state. Here the issue, I mean, many banks have financed uh, the companies that are doing this. Uh, in our case, we did not because the way it is structured, uh, you, they collect the money, they pay the government, and then they wait for the government to pay them back. And it's created a lot of, uh, there's a huge delay, and uh, the companies are, pay, are paying high cost on, their, on the loans, on, on, on the debt, which is uh, I mean, very costly and, and uh, risky. So this is why we were not supporting this, but it depends on the type of contracts you sign with the government. And I believe if there is a will uh, to, uh, to allow the private sectors to, uh, to take over those services, uh, we'll find the solutions. And banks are ready to finance them. These are the kind of opportunities you are looking for. Mr. Brijo, ahla wa sahla. Yes, of course, Mr. Moshe. Uh, could you elaborate uh, on the input and the importance of the central bank circular 331? Yes, of course. It's possible. Uh, it is very rare uh, that the central bank, uh, I think it's a, it's a first worldwide that central bank decide to support uh, startups. And basically by providing uh, the support to the banks and giving the incentives to the bank to invest equity, uh, a portion of their equity, in startups. So in fact, what, what the central bank is doing, uh, they have put a ceiling. We are allowed to invest 3% of our equity uh, in startups. And uh, so it's $400 million. This is why it's $400 million. And the central bank is guaranteeing 75% of the amount. So the banks are only taking a risk for 25%. And central bank is getting in return 50% of the profits of the operations. And uh, the, the, the ecosystem started building uh, uh, during the, 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 the years 2000. In 2000, uh, I think around seven, eight, uh, 
uh, you had two startups that were two uh, funds that were established in Lebanon, very tech fund one, and uh, building block uh, supported by an organization called Bad Air. And since then, we have seen many, many initiatives. And you have now three other funds that are operating in Lebanon. Uh, you have uh, Baytech Fund 2, you have uh, MEVP, Middle East Venture Partners, and uh, LEAP, LEAP Fund. Uh, LEAP and Baytech, they have above $80 million. They ra have raised $80 million each from banks. And now they are locating it to startups that are uh, already quite successful. We have witnessed this year the first exit of a Lebanese uh, startups. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a startup that uh, is uh, publishing uh, recipes online. Uh, and they were acquired by a Japanese company for, I think, $30 million. Wow. Yeah, so it's uh, very impressive. Hi, my name is Anthony from Toronto, and my question is about bonds. Have you, have you heard of diaspora bonds before? <coughs> I'm not sure I heard the question. Have you heard of diaspora bonds? The idea of diaspora bonds that you give bonds to your citizens living outside of the country. Do we invest in bonds or issue bonds? Like, the idea of diaspora bonds is that if you have citizens living abroad, you give bonds to them and to help with deal with the debt, and it's been taken by other countries such as Israel and India, it's helped give them economic growth. Could we do a similar initiative in Lebanon to help deal with our debt and help build our economy? Thanks.